Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I think um, Mark is watching over the shoulder. And yeah, good, mo good morning, everybody, and, and, and apologies that I can't be with you in person, but um, COVID finally caught up with me at the tail end of last week. So um, whilst I am feeling a lot better today, uh, I'm still testing positive. So obviously I've uh, dialed into this call. And I don't know if you're aware, uh, Councillor Lacker, but unfortunately Linda is also uh, tested positive and she is still quite poorly. So I think this morning she's she's not able to join us. So. Yes, that's uh, what um, Brandy just told me. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. It's, uh, in a way, it is probably a one-way blessing. You didn't have to get wet in the rain to be here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. There's always a positive side despite the disparity and things. Anyway, yeah. welcome, welcome all to the Order Risk and Insurance Committee. Um, please settle wherever you can. And um, I may not be remembering everybody's name. It'd be helpful if some, when somebody raised the hand, when speak, please um, uh, mention your name. And so my old memory can jog somewhere. Uh, any apologies? Yes, Chair, we have two apologies from Councillor Bardsley and Councillor Mason. Okay, apologies accepted. Right, uh, any declaration of interest? Anybody? No, shouldn't be. Uh, Chairs, remarks. Mark, have you got anything to say at this stage? Yeah, just a couple of quick introductory comments. Uh, first of all, um, just to uh, let uh, members of the committee know, I've, I've continued with the sort of um, uh, observation and attendance at uh, since our last meeting. Two board meetings, two investment board meetings, one overview and scrutiny meeting, one whistleblowing triage meeting, um, and you, I, and Councillor Butt. Um, attended a meeting, did we not, uh, a couple of weeks ago, with, which was a, a meeting initiated by local government association and coordinated by Telford and Rekin District Council for chairs of audit of bodies in the West Midlands. Um, um, uh, I, I have followed up that call, offering to provide a bit more um, insight into the operation of this committee. <laughs> And also to, to, to ask about whether or not they would like some help coordinating a future meeting. I haven't heard back from them as of yet, but I don't know whether yourself or Councillor Bott wanted to, to comment on that. But uh, that was really uh, um, thing in terms of activities since our last meeting. Uh, and I say the only thing I was going to say in respect of today's meeting is I think key areas of focus are clearly to hear from the external auditors and, the, and their plans for the current year and to just sign off on the internal audit plan but i think those are the two key priorities for today okay thank you ellen you want to say anything on this no i think it was a very positive meeting um and the only thing that i'm, I'm pleased they accepted was that we share any minutes with the wider group within our own authorities and not just for the members of that committee so you know we should be able to share spread the gospel or whatever comes out of it but yeah positive meeting thank you yes i agree with both our colleagues uh because i was the third one from us to attend uh it is initiated by lga mainly to sort of uh sort of the issues if there are any uh we can get together then we can all have our own way of work uh, dealing with it and i think it's a good, good initiative i'll leave the chair to the rest of the stuff which he would be agreed uh, and so uh, that's uh, helpful. Right. Item four minutes. Uh, obviously, page from one to six. I hope I hope everybody read it. And um, do we accept as a true record? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Prada. Thank you very much. Uh, can I also say before I go further, before uh, matters rising? Uh, some of us are not so young. Sometimes the blood pressure is mounting quite quickly. So about 11-ish, after 11-ish, we'll have five minutes of five easy break, okay? I'm, I'm using my discretion, uh, Mark, on this as a chair today. <laughs> uh, you have my full support, so it will help me get a cup of coffee. <laughs> Thank you. And also there's the issue further down, the private uh, issue, I, I, I rather put in case anybody's listening in the public, 
that will be a, a, a private meeting, not for public. So I think it's better to highlight here. Uh, obviously, we'll go through the agenda as we go. OK, uh, any matters arising? Mark, have you got anything to say on it? I, I don't think so. I think, uh, oh, sorry, just one one comment. There was a, uh, item 40 in those minutes referenced the, um, the PSAA appointments process for external auditors. Um, that, that then did progress um, at the final stage, I believe 470 of the 475 eligible bodies signed up to participate, and that included obviously all seven. The, the reference here was Birmingham was expected to confirm, and it, and it did subsequently. So all seven of the, the Met, um, constituent authorities signed up, um, as well as the combined authority. Um, and the tender process kicked off last week. So the tender, the tender for 23, 24 audits and beyond uh, was issued on the 7th of April and responses are due in by the 11th of July. So um, I, that's another topic that we will obviously come back to in due course, but um, it's all progressing as, as previously set out. Thank you very much. Equity and inclusion scheme, 2022-24, Anna. Good morning. Oh, okay, good morning, Anna. Yes. It's can you yours. hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Brilliant. Good morning, and apologies I couldn't be there today. It's for the uh, same reasons, COVID-related reasons. So apologies I couldn't be there in person. So I'm just here to offer a brief overview of the equity and inclusion scheme. This was approved at WMCA board in March, and is, it is now published on the WMCA website, along with a number of alternative formats to uh, support accessibility requirements. So you may already be aware that uh, we do have, as a public body, um, an obligation, a statutory obligation to publish uh, equality objectives at up to four year intervals. We have decided to do this in the form of an equity and inclusion scheme. Uh, the scheme itself essentially highlights our vision, our ambitions and our objectives for promoting equality, diversity and inclusion. Uh, we did focus on the different protected characteristics in line with Equality Act requirements, but we also wanted to offer a broader overview as well, uh, highlighting within the schemes how our different activities and objectives can help tackle socioeconomic inequalities, which which are very much intrinsically linked with different protected characteristics as well. <coughs> the uh, aim of the scheme itself was to show, to highlight what our past successes have been, what we're currently doing and what we're proposing to do to address inequalities. And we wanted to make it very clear that um, through this the scheme that all different, um, you know, all different directors, all different policy areas have uh, an important role to play uh, in realizing our wider vision around inclusion. Um, there are four main objectives uh, to the scheme. One is internal around workforce uh, inclusion, uh, diversity. Um, one focuses very much on transport uh, accessibility, inclusivity and affordability. Uh, there is one scheme that covers the other policy areas and what is happening, for example, within skills or what will be happening within skills, within housing and uh, all the different policy areas. And there is also uh, an objective that is uh, focusing on how we will embed uh, equality and inclusion within work areas and how we will influence uh, the region uh, in uh, supportive positive outcomes as well. Um, we did undergo, even though it was not a requirement for the purposes of the scheme, we did undergo a six week engagement period with the public uh, around the scheme. Uh, we received some useful feedback. It was positive feedback. Uh, we only made a few changes as a result of that uh, feedback we received, uh, mostly around language uh, used within the scheme. Uh, and um, um, I think this is this is it really. It is now published on the website uh, and uh, there is an action plan linked to it, which will be monitored and reported back on an annual basis as well. If you have got any questions or any comments, I'm here to answer them. 
Thank you very much. Colleagues, any questions? That's a bit silence. <laughs> that's, that's unusual silence, I think I should say. Thank you very much, Anna. You've done a good job. That's, that means that nobody wants to ask the question. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Have Cheers. a nice rest of the day. Okay, Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye. Uh, delivery of the annual business plan. Fiona. Morning. All right, thank you. Yes, thank you. Please, floor is yours. Thank you. So, um, our app is recommended to note the new dynamic business planning process. This paper is for information discussion. Um, it is the first annual business plan of the combined authority falling from the corporate aims and objectives, which were agreed by the WMCA board in November 21. The annual business plan is actually an internal document and it provides a really vital link between the aims through a series of activity measures, which we call high level deliverables, uh, down to the individual performance management, which all staff have IPM goals. Um, you're probably aware of the NASA analogy and we're working towards that so that everybody across the combined authority, every member of staff, can see how their contribution helps achieve the vision of the combined authority. So the high level deliverables of which we have 136 this month, this year, are measured and reported to the strategic leadership team on a monthly basis. This is together with a, a, a very dyna dynamic uh, dashboard that we have, a very visually rich dashboard, which um, supports evidence-based decision-making by showing performance information of the HLDs uh, together with the strategic risk register and also finance budget code. So that information is triangulated, enabling the strategic leadership team to identify uh, whether we have the right resources, both people and financial, to be able to deliver. Uh, we are moving towards a more dynamic business planning process. Uh, instead of an, a process that takes a, a few months in the autumn where we look at budgets and we look at what we want to achieve next year, we're moving towards regular conversations. So every couple of months our finance and HR business partners meet with the business planning specialists, the workforce management leads and the delivery directorates. So I'd like Eric to be assured that this new integrated process um, really focuses on ensuring that activity is joined up with finance and resources and uh, that we have the that we have the right resources in place to deliver the annual business plan um, in a very flexible way in a more agile way uh, given that funding can often land on us uh, with quite a short time period so happy to answer any questions Thank you very much. I think there's one comment I just removed quickly is um, paying the money back within eight days. I thought that's a good part rather than holding it back. And any comments, colleagues? Councillor Prada. Not enough resources, people wise, manpower to do with this. Yes, we do at the moment. Uh, what we have done is we did an exercise uh, towards the end of last year where we looked at the resources of every team across the combined authority and identified how many fixed term, how many temporary contractors we also have. Now, within my team, I have a workforce management lead. And one thing that we want to uh, get better at is <coughs> looking at the talent and skills of our workforce and moving those in a more agile way. So if we uh, require more resources, for example, for the CRSTS funding, which is coming into TFWM, it's looking at the skills and talent we have in other parts of the organisation um, to move more flexibly. But that more dynamic process enables us to look at that on a more regular basis. OK, anybody else? Mark, you want to? Yeah. Well, I think I think I think Fiona, you you have you know the, the key reason we asked for this paper to come was this question of resourcing and capability and capacity, um, and it sounds like you're pretty um, 
you know, a lot more than that. You know, I'm, I'm yeah, I was quite impressed with all the, uh, the, the Power BI reporting, the, dy you know, the dynamic reporting, so that's really good. But back on that point, you referenced the fact we got 42 vacancies at the moment. Um, I don't know whether that's a high number or a low number or, or typical. And I suppose, it, is, there, is there any update on attrition? You know, there, there seems to be a quite a strong view out there at the moment that um, uh, recruitment and retention are, are business critical issues for many organisations at the moment. But I don't know how our attrition is holding up and I don't know whether 42 is a, a typical level of um, recruitment activity. Thanks, thanks, Mark. I think there's, can I add alongside? I mean, there's a number of, uh, we've got Steve is nervous uh, and is uh, helping us on today. I mean, there's a number of people who are in that kind of contract, so services. Uh, I'm, forgive me my ignorance in this, because they are usually costing more to the authority. There should be some plan that they should be more uh, regular. I'm sure Mark might agree with me on this. Because uh, when you get the uh, sort of a, a moving sort of stuff, yeah. that continuity just falls off. So mm -hmm. it's better that we have a staff somewhere in the in order <coughs> that we carry on with the uh, 42 vacancies is quite a bit. But plus uh, the staff, the way senior staff, the way we are, uh, sometimes the continuity is helpful. I'm, I'm, I'm sure Mark might endorse my view as well. But can, can you please take that? Um, yeah, yeah. yeah I, just to emphasize, I actually I forgot to mention I also had a, a meeting with Laura Show, the chief executive, and that issue I uh, did get flagged in that meeting as well. So yeah, yeah, good, thank you. I think it's fair to say in terms of those forty-two members of staff that uh, vacancies that we have, um, I would have to talk to the head of people, the head of HR, to understand a little bit more about that. But actually, I sit on the corporate management team, and every month we look at what we call organisational health of the organisation. And yes, we have seen the turnover of staff increase over the past year. Um, Lin uh, Linda Horn has done a lot of work with our strategic leadership team to have a look at our enabling services so that we are resourced to have a professional specialist enabling services, again, that <coughs> plays to the needs of the combined authority and the funding that comes in. And we are also looking at succession planning across the organisation. So piece of work has already happened with SLT for them to identify talent within their areas. But heads of service now, we are all looking at succession planning uh, within, our, within our teams, but also making sure that we're adequately resourced. So if I can get back to you, Mark, on that number of 42, um, I think it would also be worthwhile to provide some context around how long some of those vacancies have been in place. If it's under 20 days, uh, we don't really see that there's an issue. That is a normal recruitment period, but I'll, I'll find some more information out for you and circulate it through Wendy afterwards. Please, thank you very much. Yeah. I, th I think that a question, uh, um, just to, to flag to your point, Chair, Vice Chair, <laughs> the, uh, how, many, how many people we have on temporary contracts would be also helpful to know. Yeah, good idea. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, please. Thank you. Um, not quite sure where this fits. So if it's if it's not a problem, let me know. Um, I'm Kate Shaw I'm from GBS Lab. You already done that. Well, then, yeah, thank you. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. Carry on. Okay. Um, so I'm Kate Shaw I'm from GBS Lab, um, and I'm just really interested how this crosses over with the risk register, which obviously has got a huge <laughs> amount of information in. So it's almost like you know, a cube of, of information. But also, for example, the whole levelling up white paper and the LEP review, which I think most um, most members will be familiar with the fact that the new letter has come out for the LEP review. There'll be a huge integration plan this year, potentially a lot of 2P conversations. Um, and I know there is conversation about whether 2P applies or not. 2P does apply. <laughs> so there'll be a big conversation around that. And I think it possibly is going to get to the point where it's going to need an item on its own because there are lots and lots of... Um, of crossovers and it's a terribly complicated plan um, but I think it would be quite good to see how the risk of that is impacted across the whole piece because um, the distraction alone I think can be really quite um, uh, debilitating. That's helpful actually. When is likely that plan coming up for consideration? <laughs> um, uh, interestingly the so we've had a letter we've had the lesson now for about 10 days um, 
uh, leaders have written and lectures are, are, are working together as yeah. part of the bigger plan. So I would expect to see something in the next three or four <laughs> weeks. Um, some LEPs will have to report by um, June and some will be reporting by January. So either way, the whole year will be taken up with the integration plan at that point. And so I think it's really good that it's on your radar. That possible. means feedback will come back at some stage, obviously apart from the Fiona's email. Uh, uh, the, the protest will be issued. OK, any more it's questions, yeah. colleagues? We accept that. Sorry. Yes, sir. Um, that's a good question on the, uh, the staffing. What, what do we consider as the uh, health ratio of contracted staff against permanent staff? Hmm. The ratio against the permanent staff? In, in a team of 10, say, how many would you say was safe to have permanent against contracted? So from a LEP point of view, yeah. we would have a very different take on it because our funding is so short term. We've never been able to offer permanent contracts apart from a few two people that have come over from Birmingham City Council. Okay. So we're continually working, and I, I, I presume with your with your funding window, it's exactly the same. So it's how do you how do you offer job security, but at the same time offer financial um, um, compliance to your to your funding window. And I think every single organisation is different. If you've got a stability of funding, then you would look to make sure it was maybe an 80 20 scenario. If you've got a longer term plan for three to five years, but for us, we continually hand to mouth. Um, and we're very lucky. We've got a lot. Of, we've got a lot of law people, as I'm sure you have, who are actually trust us that when we say funding will come, it will. So we just cross our fingers and hope it will. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we accept the recommendations yeah. and move on um, with the next item. Uh, West Midland Combined Authorities DG Risk Update. Peter. It's too technical for me, yeah, that's why I'm a technical person. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, yeah. Um, uh, yes, good Good morning, everybody. Um, there are several papers in front of you um, relating to the, the strategic risks uh, that uh, the Combined Authority faces. The groundwork for all of those papers um, was undertaken by my predecessor in, in January or February of, of this year. So there's been quite a lag between when a lot of that work was uh, was undertaken and when the discussions were uh, sort of taking place. Um, I took these to the SLT uh, a few weeks ago and had a, a very useful discussion with them at that time. Um, so I'm not planning now to go through all of those papers line by line, but what I would like to do is focus on some of the key messages that came out of that very useful discussion with the uh, with, with the SLT. Um, and I think there's uh, there's there's a lot that's explained in those papers, but what I really sort of focus on is uh, the the discussion around uh, the, the conflicts in in the uh, in Ukraine. Um, uh, my request or suggestion that there be some sort of deep dives into the highest rated risks um, and the the situation with regard uh, the, the, the trams. So, in terms of the uh, conflicts in Ukraine. Um, there was some sort of initial consideration of the high level effects of that conflict. A briefing note was produced. Um, uh, the uh, SLT have asked me to keep that under uh, regular review, which uh, we, we are doing. Um, uh, and in addition, they recognise um, a message around the cybersecurity concerns um, and have asked that that be reflected in the next version of the Strategic Risk Register. So we will reflect that and reflect the activity that we have uh, under, undertaken. I've had some discussions already with uh, Jason Danbury um, and another colleague uh, to start to think about what we what we need to do to, to sort of capture that and to reflect what activity they've already put in place. Um, separate to that, there's been uh, there was a, a suggestion that I made around uh, those highest level risks, uh, which uh, hadn't seemed to have had a lot of sort of change um, over the, the, the last few months. Um, and as as the newbie, um, I suggested it might be a good idea if I sort of have a look at those, get under skin of those risks. Um, and sort of explore with the risk owners what their real concerns were, what activity was in place, etc. Um, and I'm going to undertake those deep dives and come back to the SLT in May. So the, again, the risk register hopefully will look uh, quite sort of different in terms of some of that detail when you when you next get a chance to have a look at it. 
And finally, on the trams, um, we have uh, a risk that has materialised, so we do now have uh, an issue in the issue log, um, and that was around the, uh, the cracks in the Metro 2 GT fleet. Um, normally, uh, you know, good risk methodology might be that once a risk is materialised, it comes off the risk register, it goes into the issue log. Uh, but the SLT have asked us to uh, look at perhaps redefining uh, the risk. I think there's a point there about making it perhaps slightly more strategic. So rather than specifically having a strategic risk around the cracks, um, it's it's we, we're going to have a look at coming up with a risk more around train tram availability more 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 broadly. Um, so that that work will also be undertaken. So I think they were some of the sort of the key things. There's probably other messages in there, um, and I'm happy to take any questions. On on that, just to, just to follow up. Uh, risks, nine risks, high risks, and so on. I understand it's good that you you highlighted them. Is there a mitigation plan in some way in order to to address those? That's the uh, that, that that will help to understand. Yeah. So uh, so for each of those uh, risks, there is uh, activity either that's sort of currently in place or or or, or being planned, um, and we we do have the the sort of detail of that there. Um, my my issue, part of what I want to do with the deep dives, really, is is to really ensure that those that activity, if it's been undertaken, has it had any effect on the on the on the risk? I'm I'm not entirely sure that I'm seeing that at the moment, and I think some of it could be. It's just that we've not perhaps captured it. Um, but I also think there's probably other activity that we're then planning to undertake, um, and we may not have captured that as well. So this is really an opportunity to really refresh that. There is activity in place. I'm not sure that all of it's perhaps been, been captured uh, appropriately at the moment. Thank you. Mark, you want to say anything on this particular? Yeah, um, I, was, I was exactly that point, actually. I think... I, I think it's very important that we do constantly look at the, the strategic risks and, and, and reassess them. But I think it's important that we do it at both the gross level and the residual level and look at the mitigations that are in place. So um, I, I welcome the fact that that's what you're going to do, Peter, as part of this exercise, um, which I'll come back to in a minute when we just talk about the, the proposal to take the a, a adult education risk off. Um, on, con on Ukraine, uh, and one, I, uh, I'm encouraged to see that we, we don't appear to have any direct contractual relationships. Um, there are obviously a number of organisations who have um, energy uh, supply contracts, um, but I'm pleased to see that we don't appear to. Um, I also spoke to Jason about the Ukraine cyber position because the NCSC had issued a, an 11 point plan in terms of recommended actions. Um, I had a, a good conversation with him about that. Uh, the only issue that came up about that from that was that the the organisation providing cyber support to Midland Metro Limited did use Kaspersky antiviral software, uh, which is an area that um, has been flagged as a potential risk. So I think Jason was following up on that, but it, you know. The, um, uh, it's encouraging to see on that one. And um, yeah, on Metro, I, I completely concur with the view that it would be <laughs> it would be unwise to take Metro off the risk register simply because this particular issue has emerged. Clearly, that broader strategic risk around availability of Metro and its development and evolution continues to be an area that needs very careful monitoring. So. I'm, I'm very supportive of, of the comments you made. Should I just pick up on this point? You you didn't flag it in your introduction, Peter, but the, the proposal to take a couple of risks off the res register and, 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 and move them to the directorate level. Yeah. yeah. And my, my only question there was on adult education. Mm. Um, it has got quite a high gross risk, but the, the reason it is at a, such a low residual risk is because of the effectiveness of the mitigating controls. Um, and I would want to be assured that we are comfortable that is the case, given that earlier in the year we had an internal audit report which flagged some concerns and we have had a whistleblowing issue that is in that area as well. So um, I, I would want to be assured that we were comfortable that that net position is right and thus it is appropriate to demote that risk to um, 
uh, the position of uh, being manager at directorate level. Thanks, Chair. Okay, with the with that uh, recommendation from Mark, with the demoting that part, uh, do we agree? Or, uh, June May, any comments? Further comments, Peter? Uh, all I can say at the moment from from this is that uh, sort of reading that that risk register, it feels to me as if the the, the view is that the uh, the audit um, and our response to that audit. Um, and our sort of monitoring and compliance with that is is what is giving us uh, the, the sort of the assurance that that that, that risk is is now sort of uh, sort of being sort of de worthy of de-escalation and has been brought under control. Um, but I don't know if there's anything more that we can say about that at the moment. Okay, if that's the case, we go back on to page fifty-one. I think there's recommendations on it. Uh, uh, alongside what um, Mark said uh, to put that in order. So report will be coming back, did you say in May? Uh, so I'm going to the uh, SLT in May, so I'm okay, assuming yeah. that this will, be, uh, yeah. this will be June. Okay, sometimes, yes. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, that's, uh, um, I don't think anybody disagrees with the recommendations. Is it? No, we accept it. Thank you very much. Uh, we're moving, moving on with the agenda. Uh, single insurance framework. Sorry, is it? Yes, it is single insurance framework. Assur assurance performance report October to March. Sorry, I should put. Can I also say, say when other people are speaking, please, um, uh, uh, when you finish the speaking, switch off the microphone, which I did. Now I forgot to switch it on. <laughs> so and also vice versa, <laughs> so everybody can have that conversation. Um, right. Uh, I think um, on my uh, the sheet, it says Jyoti Sharma. Yeah, oh, you, sorry? Objective. Yeah, yeah, I, that's what I thought it should be. Yes. <laughs> uh, there's a Ian to sports. You said Ian was sporting uh, somewhere? No, Jyoti is here. That's fine. Yes, mm. boss, carry on. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, audit committee. Um, so, as mentioned in, in section one of the, the report today, the report is being presented for, for information for the audit risk and assurance committee. Uh, Jyoti, um, will you please pull that closer to you so everyone can hear it? Is that better? Yes. Yes, thank you. Um, so, just a little bit of background. The, um, the last assurance report was presented to this committee in November of last year. That was the first performance report that was presented. Um, and the aim at that time was to roll out the single assurance arrangements, the SAP arrangements to the wider um, project portfolios in the um, West Midlands combined authority. The last um, assurance performance report was requested by um, the committee and was presented um, in November and covered the reporting period of April to September. The report today is the follow on report. Um, and covers the period of October to, to March. Um, just moving to table 1.3, which I think is on page two, um, really summarises the, the activity in this reporting period. So up to the blue line, um, about a third of the way down, um, summarises position as reported at the last committee. Um, and the subsequent periods that are covered um, for the remainder of that table, which shows that there has been substantial progress which has been made since the report was last presented. Uh, moving to section three, so section two and um, the rest of section one and two goes into the, the detail and I have to take questions um, afterwards. The summary position in section three really summarises um, the, the report. So positive indicators are demonstrated as um, frequent C. So the table um, on page two shows up all the various different indicators in terms of business case reviews, a change request, the assurance and appraisal activity has increased in the, in the last reporting period. Um, and we have a lot of insightful information which is coming um, out of those reviews now as well that will be able to feed back as lessons learnt and, and knowledge into the organisation mm -hmm. as well. 
point D summarises now that the, the number of business cases reviewed by the, the team, so the programme assurance and appraisal team are the second line of defence, um, part of the <coughs> second line of defence, so we are the independent team, independent of um, the project delivery teams, um, having undertaken the independent assurance reviews on all the project business cases that have been submitted in this, this period. Um, are demonstrating that the business cases are compliant to Cabinet Office, HM Treasury, Green Book Standard um, against the, the five cases, the review that's been undertaken by the, the team assesses um, the business case in terms of their maturity levels and we've seen a positive trend of the business cases presented in this period that have indicated that there has been some increase in terms of um, the maturity levels of those business cases in this last reporting period, um, which again is a, a positive indicator. Um, and point F is really the, the value in terms of what the strategic leadership team and the statutory officers in particular um, wanted to achieve in the fact that we needed to be compliant to the, the standards, so that has been met or is being met, um, which again is, is positive. But the real value of um, utilising the single assurance framework is the fact that we're compliant to the, the governance and the constitution and also the standards and it provides a, a, a stronger basis in terms of taking opportunities in the future in the Western Midlands Combined Authority being able to demonstrate um, maturity in project management delivery. Sorry, I just, just got this distracted with my phone. I should switch it off, actually. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem with it. Happy to take any questions. Sorry, just let me get myself in order. Uh, sorry about that. <coughs> sorry about that. Any, any comments, please, colleagues? Any questions? Mark? I, I thought section three was really helpful. Thank you. In terms of summarising the, you know, the, the conclusions and and you know being constructive about the you know recognising the progress, but also being clear about the recommendations. I think my one question, which I raised with you previously, when you sent me the draft, Jyoti, was just the position around housing and regen and their participation in this. Could you just yeah. say a few words on that? So what we've been able to, to do in the last period is we've worked very closely with each of the, the, the project directorates. Um, and so the, the table demonstrated in um, 1.6 page 3, um, we do now have a view and visibility of, of the project activity across each of the, the directorates. So there's a high number of projects captured for housing and regeneration. We're still working with two of the directorates to actually confirm their transition plans, but there's um, there's deep conversations that are happening with those particular directorates. With housing and regeneration, although there's a lot of project activity, and we've spoken to um, Peter as well from the strategic risk position, is that it's, it's lower value, so there's a lot of projects, but typically between the one of, and five million pounds, so it's lower ends of the threshold, financial threshold, um, and typically lower risk. So we're working, continuing to work with the, the director to actually um, propose some transition plans. So there's, there's conversations that are happening there. So although we haven't undertaken formal um, single assurance reviews on the business cases for those particular areas, each of the, the projects still present are presented to the, the correct statutory level for authority and approval to progress. Um, and we're working with the directors to actually develop plans on how to um, how to transition over and we're working with a number of colleagues including taking advice from from Peter in terms of how we apply a proportionate approach um, to that particular directorate so within the single assurance framework and the and the HM Treasury guidance um, the assurance arrangements can be proportionate it doesn't have to be the same approach approach for all projects and directorates I'm confident um, by the time that we report in the next um, reporting period that we will be able to demonstrate how they have transitioned over. So there is assurance that there are conversations being held um, on how to achieve that objective. Okay, thank you very much, Jyoti, thanks. Uh, any follow-up, anybody, any comments? This, yes, please. Um, yes, very good uh, presentation. I was here when, uh, is it Jyoti, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. See, I'll say properly. 
<laughs> Jyoti. Yeah. No, it's not Jyoti. Jyoti. No, no, that's how it's written here. Okay. <laughs> that the way you spell it, because we have both, both Punjabis and Indians, so we understand the Y with it. J O Y E T. Y. Yes. Yeah. That's very, very visual and uh, nice to see there are war going on. Do we have enough manpower to monitor this in, in the teams? Yes, um, so we've recruited to the, the team in order to undertake this activity um, and there's been recognition with an increase in, in project activity with the new programmes being initiated that there's been additional resources approved as well to be funded for those programmes. Um, what this will allow um, by going a consistent um, approach in terms of the application of assurance and appraisal is a lot of organisational insight. So actually the, the amount of activity that it takes to review business cases now shouldn't be the same in the future. Um, so yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I don't think there is any recommendation other than just noting the report as a progress. Thank you very much, Jyoti. Thanks for Thank this report. Sorry, I should put that on. So we note the report and move on. Thank you very much. Uh, the next item, internal audit annual report. Peter Farlow was... Ah, oh, okay, that's why I couldn't see you on this side. Thank you, Peter, nice to see you. Yes, uh, yes, floor is yours. Uh, Thank you. Uh, on, 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 on a curious position, why you are not here today? <laughs> Sorry, I just... Same <laughs> So you can wet. <laughs> yes, uh, somebody just mentioned one to stop getting wet, but two, I've got a clash of meetings that follow immediately after, unfortunately. Okay. So all apologies, right. apologies for not being there in person. That's all right. Carry on, please. Yeah. As long as we do the business. Yes. Thanks, Chair. Yeah. So we've got two items of business for you today. The first one is the annual internal audit report, which is the document that summarises all the work that we've undertaken over the last 12 months and our act members may recall that at the start of each year you approve an internal audit plan which lists a range of planned internal audit reviews we undertake those reviews report back to our act throughout the year then at the end of the year we pull all of that work together and the purpose of that is to enable us to give an annual head of audit opinion to yourselves our act and to the wider combined authority the sort of key areas to point you towards in the in the report is probably page 85 where at the bottom of that page we just remind members that each review we undertake we give a level of assurance to and worst case being no assurance then escalating upwards to limited assurance satisfactory assurance or substantial assurance and then we take a wider view of all the pieces of work and the levels of assurance that we give and that then enables me to arrive at an audit opinion, which is at the top of that same page, at the top of page 85. And I'll, I'll just read out the first paragraph, which says, based on the work that we've undertaken during the year and the implementation of management by recommendations, etc., we are able to give reasonable assurance that the combined authority has adequate and effective internal controls, risk management and governance. So the two options available to us as your internal auditors are, we can provide reasonable assurance or we're unable to provide reasonable assurance. So being able to provide reasonable assurance is an unqualified opinion. So it is a, a good, positive opinion. Now, just flagging to members the work that we completed during the year that has enabled us to arrive at that decision is highlighted in a table on page 87 of the pack. That lists all the reviews that we undertook, the number of red, amber or green recommendations, and then the total number of recommendations and whether or not they've been accepted by the combined authority. And I think all the recommendations we made in year at the time this report was produced uh, were accepted. And the end column, which is probably the most important, which is the level of assurance. And as you'll see there, there's a, a large number of substantial and satisfactory levels of assurance. A number of those reviews we've already brought before ARAC and discussed at previous meetings. Since we last met, we have completed those at the bottom of the table. So they're the six key financial systems reviews. And as you'll see there, uh, we've given satisfactory or substantial assurance to each of those. 
And because that is a quite a large piece of work, and we want to thank Linda and the finance team for working with us on that. We have appended that report for members so you can have sight of the detail and possibly discussion of those matters shortly. And also just to flag to your attention that the last piece of work that we've issued prior to the year end, unfortunately, was a limited assurance report, which was to do with the park and ride arrangements at the Longridge uh, Park, uh, park and ride uh, alongside the, the train metro route. That was limited assurance. And again, because that's limited assurance, we've appended that report. So at the back of this annual report, you've got two reports. One, the key financial systems, which I appreciate is quite a lengthy document, and the Longridge, Longbridge report. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to briefly hand over to Sandra, who will touch upon some of those key issues in both the key financial systems and the Longbridge, Longbridge report. Thanks, Sandra. Welcome, Sandra. Thank you. Hello. Um, I'll just skip to um, page 92, where we have got a summary um, of the key financial systems audits, and you'll see that we've given um, five um, audits substantial rating um, with a collectively four green recommendations, which are largely to do with just recording some of the processes that have been undertaken. So we found no major issues there. Um, we gave a um, satisfactory opinion for accounts payable and made five AMBA recommendations. So if I bring your attention to page 99 in the report. Um, as I said, you, you have got a report for each of the um, key financials, but if I bring your attention to accounts payable, um, and you, as you'll see on page 99, um, we've listed the five AMBER issues. Um, the first one being related to the unique tax references where VAT numbers were not always obtained. Making recommendations that these are obtained, having consulted legal as well in terms of the implications and um, the application um, to the combined authority. But in order to uh, comply with um, demonstrating tax evasion prevention, it's, it's um, key that the uh, combined authority now ensures that they do collect um, unique tax references, largely from self-employed um, suppliers, um, to be compliant with the Criminal Finance Act 1972. Um, again, the second issue is, is largely to do with the alternative mechanism of payment. Just to point out that the vast majority of payments that are processed for the combined authority are through its standard system in, in business world and its ordering goods receiving invoicing process, which we found to be robust and testing confirmed that that had been followed consistently. So payment via CHAPS is an alternative means of payment where you may may not have an invoice, uh, you need to make an urgent payment, and this is a direct payment to a supplier or individual. And we found that the, uh, the supporting documentation could have been more fully completed and evidence is authorised prior to being processed. However, we appreciate these used to be manuscript documents and the working remotely online may have exasperated the completion of this. However, we've recommended that they look into this and come up with a workable solution to ensure that forms are fully completed and they clearly evidence that they're authorised. Um, the third point is, is in relation to um, supplier record creation amendments involving bank detail changes. Now, this is key in terms of the prevention and detection of um, bank mandate fraud. So, Robustness around this area is is paramount, and um, it does it does need uh, it does evolve because um, fraud becomes ever ever more sophisticated. So this is to ensure that as of today, what we know, these are the best um, processes that we have in place, um, and we felt that there was some improvement there in terms of verification and validation of bank detail changes before they're made and how that's recorded. Um, we also picked up on duplicate payments, having identified one duplicate payment um, and in order to strengthen the command authorities um, processes for preventing and detecting um, duplicate payments. Historically, the command authority accepted the risk of the standard check in business world. However, we felt that additional checks should be undertaken, uh, which may require some developmental work in the system um, to support it with exception reports. Um, and lastly, we, we felt it was important to pick this up again as a result of working online, which in itself is workable. 
we felt that um, they need to uh, the CA needs to revisit how it uses team messages to record what it constitutes the financial records of the combined authority. Again, it's about keeping that audit trail, and we felt that could be made stronger. Um, on page one hundred one. Um, I won't go into the detail, but um, as you'll see there, each um, each AMBER recommendation is, is providing more detail, what the testing we undertook, um, the level exception, and you'll find that for the UTR, we found two instances and you will feel out of 15, is that a significant find? However, the implications of that based on sample testing mean that um, it does require some attention to, sure, to ensure that the CA can you know demonstrate it's got preventative measures for tax evasion and also it's not engaging with businesses who don't who also you know who are you know don't have a VAT registration or a UTR as demonstration of their um avoidance of tax evasion. Um, um we're happy to receive questions at this point. Thank you, Sandra. I think I found it very easy to read, actually. <coughs> this Thank you very much. With the recommendation in the back and so on. The only question I was trying to think at that time, you mentioned about the VAT. Some invoices were not with the VAT written on you or something or payments or something. Was there any misuse of it or a, a highlight? May not, we don't need the high amount, maybe small issues. But uh, is that taken on board somewhere by the administration that it has to be done properly? I think the standard process is that when supplier suppliers are first engaged with either the VAT registration or the unique tax reference number would be um, recorded on the invoice. So when the combined authority receives that, they have the information they need to be able to compliantly process that invoice. Where, um, for example, a contract is awarded and a supplier is engaged with at that point, um, the VAT registration number or, or the UTR number would be obtained and recorded in the financial system so that every time an invoice was processed, it would automatically register. You know, we, we've already got that compliance there. Um, we found in some inst in those two instances where it was a self-employed individual, um, a UTR hadn't been provided at the time prior to engagement with that supplier and hadn't been recorded on the invoice um, that was submitted to the combined authority. Therefore, um, I think on one VAT had been included and, and on one not VAT hadn't been included. Therefore, that puts implications for the combined authority in its VAT accounts. So there are there's a number of issues there. However, the standard processes that the combined authority has should ensure that going forward that these are obtained before the combined authority engage with an individual. OK, thank <coughs> Thank you very much. Before I come to Mark, anybody else? Any questions, queries, or any, any explanation? No. Mark, please. Your expertise. <laughs> um, I uh, no, I I, can, I agree with your comments. I thought I thought the uh, the accounts payable report in particular, and sorry, the annual report and the accounts payable report were very easy to read, very easy to understand. So you know, thank you. Um, just on the annual report, my only question was on and. You know, I'm a bit of a broken record on this, but on the follow up of previous recommendations, I think this is on page 94. Uh, yeah. It seems like pretty much everything um, has been most of most of the actions have been followed up or there's only one outstanding with the exception of the GDPR regs uh, work where there were 10 recommendations and only four, I think, have been followed up so far. So. Just um, interested to know if, if there's any the timing of that report, maybe that some of those have um, are due to be followed up quite soon, but it'd be good to see progress on follow up of those actions. I think it's a comment there. But other than that, I thought the annual report was really, really helpful, really good, and and obviously supportive of your opinion. And uh, I'm I'm very grateful that you are giving us reasonable assurance rather than no assurance, Peter. That would be good to hear. Um, on the accounts payable, I. <coughs> I um, yeah, it's a good report. Um, I, I would be interested whether Louise has got any reflections on this. The the bit probably that concerned me more than anything else. Oh, I hate duplicate payments, so if we see those, then that's something to clearly avoid. It's the fact that in item three, these recommendations were made in a previous audit, and they've repeated this year, and that's again not uh, not. Um, that's concerning, really, if we're, we're seeing recommendations reappear from previous reports. So 
but Lou, I don't know if did you do you want to come in? Yeah, I'll come in there. Thank you, Chair. So we've had a number of changes in staff in the team over the last two years um, in between the two audits. And it's clear we've got some further work to do to improve the quality and our ability to retrieve documents afterwards to evidence uh, that the process has been followed for particularly for chat statements and coupled with hybrid working arrangements I think we've definitely got some work to do on um, recording approvals within the team Microsoft Teams system um, and we've also got some systems changes required to record unique reference numbers which we've not actually done for individuals before to ensure that we comply with the Criminal Finance Act as Sandra said. The duplicate payment that's mentioned in the report has been recovered and we've looked we've investigated this one and it was a, a case of human error so the business world system detects invoices with the same reference number but unfortunately either the first or the second um, invoice that was input had the wrong uh, invoice number. So there's, as Sandra said, there's further work we can do there to make secondary checks um, to ensure that duplicate payments don't happen going forward. And that's all I want to say. Thank you. So with that recommendation, which Mark already highlighted the issue of one not followed up, can you put that back again? That should be followed up. That otherwise, no point having it um, done uh, highlighted unless it's followed. Is that acceptable, colleagues? This, this is the issue we should be addressing if that's the unless there is a specific problem with it. Please, chair. Sorry. Can yeah. I just? I norm, I do the review of all of the recommendations and okay, how yeah. those are being progressed. Mm -hmm. I will follow up on the GDPR to see what is delaying the delivery of those. In particular, though, one of those actions is the reaccreditation of Cyber Essentials, which I know Mark is going to provide a further update on that during the, the private session. Okay. With that assurance, we accept the report. There's a lot, a lot of recommendations gone with it, and specifically the opinion, which is very good. Thank you very much, um, Peter and Sandra. That's helpful. I agree. I was just going to say on page 116, there's a recommendation around the uh, Treasury management policy. Yeah. Uh, somebody who attended observed the board meeting, I can definitely confirm it was discussed and approved. So I think that's a minuting point rather than a uh, approval point. But anyway. Good idea. Good idea. Actually, I have my page open there at that place. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we accept that as yeah. it is. Yeah. OK. Thank you very much. Uh, move on with the. Uh, we are on internal audit plan. Sorry, Chair. I think I think there's one. There's the Longbridge Park and Ride audit, which we just need to. Uh, OK, yeah, go on, please. Yep. Who's going to address this? Sandra, is that you again? Okay. Yep. Um, so if I take you down to page. Page uh, one, 120. Yeah, we. Um, so this was a planned audit of the income management uh, arrangements for the new long bridge um, park and ride which was opened only recently last august um due to covid um and uh we've raised one red um recommendation and two amber issues on this occasion which has led to the limited opinion um the one red um recommendation is related to um the retention of signed contractual documentation as this hadn't been evidenced had been established for the commissioning of the car parking services however we found this was for longbridge and other sites so historically we weren't we weren't able to obtain the contract for that um, um, supplier providing car parking enforcement and collection of income um which unfortunately it it, um, it led to non-compliance with the contract procedure rules of the combined authority and public procurement regulations. Um, the two amber recommendations are regarding car park charges had not been evidenced as approved in accordance with combined authority governance. So again, it was to ensure that it is presented, they're reviewed, and therefore approved in evidence as such. Um, and then the second amber recommendation again was about the receiving of cash and phone payments um how that was undertaken as we didn't uh, as the um 
contractual documentation was not in place, um, how often, how and when um, that cash would be collected and therefore how the reconciliation would be undertaken um, was not clearly defined um, and reconciliation at that point, albeit the income was low, um, was yet to be fully established and undertaken on a regular basis. Um, so whilst the income was low, it was ensuring that those processes are, are there uh, ready for when um, hopefully um, take up um, increases um, post uh, the pandemic. Um, and then if I take you to um, page 121, um, focusing on the red recommendation. Again, we've provided more details as to how that's um, occurred um, in terms of the original contract documentation, uh, mm -hmm. the issuing of the contract, um, particularly for originally for one particular site, Sutton Coalfield Railway Station Park, and then its application to subsequent um, uh, facilities like Bromsgrove and Longbridge. Um, so it covers a wider, wider um, issue than just Longbridge, and that's why we felt um, the rating was appropriate on this occasion, um, whereas we have previously raised recommendations about um, contract documentation, as uh, we've reported previous to Eric uh, last year. Um, and again, we've provided more details about the AMBER recommendations as well. Um, I won't go to any more detail to give you opportunity to raise any questions. Right. Any questions, colleagues? Can I just ask one of the issues of the car park, which probably every local authority suffers from the break ins when there's money in the, in the car park charges, people rob it. And is, the, is, uh, is there a system um, that's not audits, so perhaps a direct concern, but obviously it's a concern. Uh, somebody must be uh, making sure that those um, part of stolen money is uh, somewhere recovered some way or, or managed some way mitigation system is in place. I'm not sure if anybody can respond to it, but uh, this is the I, I usually, usual issue for all the probably local authorities where the money is put in the slots and somebody just takes it away afterwards. Uh, so it's just an issue perhaps um, you might have seen it, Peter, already somewhere. Uh, so if there is an issue, please um, keep an eye on it. Other than, other than that, I think we accept the recommendations uh, as key issues identified and so on. Yeah? Yeah, can I can I just come? Yeah. The, the the response says that we couldn't we could, management couldn't provide signed copies of contracts in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. Is it is it a timely manner, or they just couldn't get them, or because they hadn't actually been signed? Right. They 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 weren't provided at all. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not sure it's to do with timeliness. It's just it's to do with the fact that the, the contracts haven't actually been issued slash or signed in final form so um and now I, I you know this is an important point and as i again raised with you sandra in, in when uh, we were having a dialogue about it um it's obviously we need to rectify this situation but we need to think about the broader implications for other contracts of this nature um and um okay thank you chair can you put that up please jamie that particular which is um Yes, yes, Chair. Yeah. Chair um, I have spoken to Sandra about this issue. These are historic contracts, but I do appreciate it's, you know, it's not satisfactory. They, we weren't able to provide them um, and we have put in measures to try to stop this happening again. OK, with that, sorry, carry on, Mark. You want to say something? No, no, that was it. Thank you. OK, th thanks. With that, we accept the report. Agreed. Okay. Thank you. Where are we now? I, th I think we are going to move on item 12, aren't we? Sorry, that's, thank you very much for reminding. Yes, yeah, it'd be a good idea. We have five minutes um, easing break. Five, maximum 10 minutes, I think I should say. Uh, well, you should be back at quarter 11, quarter past 11, yeah? Irrespective, that's that'd be helpful. Is that okay by everybody? Yeah. Thank you. We can have a cup of tea as well. Refresh we ourselves. <laughs>